Hi there, it's Bonnie with So Inspired by Bonnie with another Tuesday's Tip. Today we're going to discuss freestanding uh, applique using glitter flex. Um, I'm going to go over to the computer and give me a shout out if you're here or a like or let me know where you're coming in from and that way we'll know we have some folks here. Okay. I see Brenda and Anna are here. Looks like a couple of you are starting to show up. So again, today we're going to talk about freestanding applique using glitter flex. Now, I had something else entirely planned for today's Tuesday's tip. But my friend Henry, uh, Debbie Henry, uh, wrote an article for Designs Magazine, and she told me about it, and um, said that uh, the glitter flex that she used from our store was on the cover page, and she was really excited, and I'm super excited for her. She does an excellent job of writing instructions, and she wrote an article on freestanding applique using glitter flex. Now, I didn't use her designs, I used one of my own, but I followed her concept uh, on what she did to create it because you can do this with just about any applique design. Now, I say that, and there are a couple of things you need to look for. You want a good, solid satin stitch on the outside of the applique. There's ways to work around that, but it is it involves more work on our end. So what I did was I kind of looked around to see some designs to because I wanted to pick a good applique design that had a nice satin stitch all the way around it. And I, although I love my little snow buddies, they weren't a good candidate for her technique. And the reason being is even though there's a satin stitch all around his body, up at the top of his head here, or I should say his hat, you'll see that it's a fill stitch. It's not a satin stitch up here at the top. So since it's just a fill up there, there's nothing to hold it in place. There's no placement line for the fill stitch or uh, a tack down line or fabric underneath it. It's just the fill stitch. So that wouldn't be a really good candidate. Now, having said that, there are a couple of workarounds. If you're good with your digitizing software, you can add a satin stitch around the outer parameters. You know, just make it a little bit bigger, maybe a quarter inch away. Or maybe you want to add, maybe you want to make it into an ornament and add um, the, a name and a year. You could do that and just make it a big circle. Some machines will automatically add an applique stitch or a satin stitch with the tack down and the placement lines already there. Some will do it with a contour just following the design itself which is awesome. I know that the baby lock and brother machines will do that, the higher end ones. I can't speak for the other brands but I wouldn't be surprised if the other brands can do that as well. The uh, also another option is just to make a big old circle. If you were making it into an ornament, you could make a, a large circle using your frames and a single stitch from your frames within the Baby Lock and Brothers. So you can do it, but it's added work. But I did want to give you those options because, well, that's what I'm here for is to give you options. So anyway, you can do that with any design. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even have to be an applique design as long as you add that outer parameter with a tack down, or excuse me, a placement line, a tack down, and a satin, then it'll have a base fabric that will help it to become freestanding. So that's why I brought that up, just to make you aware when you're looking into this, if you want to make it easy on yourself, look for a design that has a satin stitch outline around the applique. So what I did find in my stash was my Christmas cookies. And on the Christmas cookies, you can see he has a little satin stitch all the way around the outer parameter of the design. So he's a really good candidate for freestanding applique. Now this one I made completely reversible. So he's he looks the same front and back. So you can see 
uh, you can do that. Bear in mind, if you do something like that, you want to make sure that when you change the color of thread, you need to change the color of the bobbin as well so that everything matches up. So keep that in mind if you want to kind of change things up. You're going to be changing the bobbin with every color change. Okay, so how do we do this? <laughs> Well, it's really pretty easy as it turns out. Um, you just need to kind of think it through and do things a little bit different than you ordinarily would for a standard applique. Um, on this one, the whole design, I'm gonna use the glitter flex. Now on the little ice skates that Debbie did, she used a marine vinyl for the skates and the boots uh, I mean the boots and the heels, and then she used Glitter Flex for the blades. So it gives it that little extra pop, um, which is awesome. So whatever your applique design dictates, go for it. So on this one, I'm just kind of keeping it simple. We're just using the Glitter Flex. And of course, you'll need some Glitter Flex. You'll want to remove the clear carrier that's on top, like so. And you can use this clear carrier as your pressing sheet if you want, um, or you can just toss it. It's totally up to you. So you're going to need the Glitter Flex. You're going to need a base fabric because you want to beef up uh, your applique so that um, it's sturdier since it's freestanding. It's not just going to be on a fabric on a shirt. It's you'll want that base fabric. The other thing is, since Glitter Flex will tear, you can you know just take it and tear, uh, you need the base fabric to make it sturdy so that when it's all said and done, you can't just tear your ornament. Now, I say ornament, but the freestanding applique uh, idea can use be used for ornaments, it could be used for a tag like I did here um, for my present. It can be used, um, I thought of some other things, for play, uh, play food. You know, you see children playing with the, the um, fab, uh, not fabric, but felt. You know, they'll make play food out of uh, felt. You can use this application for that. Um, you could add a little glitter flex to that play food if you wanted to have some sparkles on maybe some cupcakes or something comes to mind. But, you know, think outside the box. Where might you want to use this as a freestanding application? There's a couple of ideas out there. But anyway, so how do we do it? You're going to want to use the uh, wash away type stabilizer. Now this kind of looks like fabric. Um, it's kind of a mesh, but it's a wash away stabilizer. Do not use the film or the plastic looking wash away stabilizer. The reason I say that, as does Debbie in her article, is it's not gonna hold up to the dense satin stitches when you're making your freestanding uh, ornament or uh, applique, I should say. It'll pull away. Uh, it might perforate and then pull away. Your registration will come off. It's just doesn't hold up as well. And even if you were to use the really super heavy duty, heavy duty plastic type wash away stabilizer, we are going to press right there in the hoop with the glitter flex and it's not going to withstand the heat. So you do want to use the wash away that kind of looks like fabric. We're going to use a base fabric on top of it because even this doesn't like a high heat. Um, but if you use a pressing cloth on top, it does fine. So you're going to hoop your wash away stabilizer. That's the first thing. And you're going to stitch out your placement line. So we're going to hoop that and you can just lay if you're certain that you've covered the whole hoop with your base fabric, you don't have to stitch out the placement line because you know it's already there. I mean, you know it's already going to be covered. You can just stitch the placement and tack down right on top of that if you'd want. So the next step, and I use these all in separate hoops here. By the time I was done, I was running out of hoops. Um, so you're going to have 
your base fabric and your wash away stabilizer and the base fabric was just laid on top it was not hooped then you again stitch your placement line and once you've stitched your placement line then you can take your glitter flex and lay it on top now the reason I brought out this little glitter flex sample is because you'll see that if I were to just put it like that it's not going to cover my placement line the nice thing about glitter flex is you can put it any direction that will work you don't have to worry about bias or anything like that with the glitter flex so if you have a piece that'll fit on there cattywampus and crooked and still cover everything go for it it'll work just fine so that's why I brought this little piece out here another tip that I wanted to bring to mind and Debbie did mention it in her article uh, she said Bonnie's tip with I thought was really cute uh, was that ordinarily when we do appliques and we put the placement line down or um, the uh, you know the material line where we want to trim we use a matching coordinating color to the fabric we're going to use because in regular fabric we can see the stitching line tone on tone very easily well with glitter flex with it being very sparkly what I noticed early on was that I couldn't see where the stitching was versus where the glitter flex was so I highly recommend as I have done here you use a contrasting color of thread so that you know where that thread is and it makes it easier to tear it away it makes it easier to trim away so bear that in mind it's a little different than your standard fabric it's it's just with all the sparkle and different highs and lows it's really hard to see if you have matching threads so make sure that you have a contrasting thread and it'll make it a lot easier on yourself to see where to trim okay so the next step is we have gotten the glitter flex on here and I hope you can see this I stitched it with red I'm gonna get up here so you can see this a little bit closer but you see even with the red it would not it doesn't show up nearly like it would if it was just on regular fabric or even red fabric so this really makes it a lot easier now let me move these to the side a little bit so hopefully you can see this <clears throat> what you can do with the glitter flex is you can either gently tear this away and I'm holding the applique portion down while I'm tearing or you can trim just whichever method works best for you I always hold this down I don't just rip because um, it could rip through my stitching and I don't want to do that so while I'm kind of tearing this away I'm being careful about it and working my way around now I can also trim and to do that you just come in like you ordinarily would and just trims really close to the stitching if you accidentally um, cut a stitch or two by trimming don't worry about it because this is going to fuse down unlike um, your fabric if you didn't use a fusible behind your fabric that would fray this is just going to fuse down and stay in place it's not going to go anywhere so if you accidentally do snip a thread or two don't don't panic it's going to be okay so you're just going to trim around and get all these little snippets out. And you're going to leave the base fabric on for right now. Because that base fabric is also going to act as a um, pressing cloth for your fusible underneath. Or not your fusible. It's going to act as a pressing cloth against your water soluble stabilizer underneath as well so you want to have that uh, fabric scrap or the base fabric laid there and again the, I didn't mention this but the base fabric can be any scrap 
because it's not going to show once it's all said and done. That's all going to get trimmed away, but you need the base fabric there, um, again, for extra support and to keep the glitter f uh, flex from, from tearing once everything's said and done. Once you have it trimmed away, then you're going to press your glitter flex and fuse it in place. Now, I don't know that I, I didn't bring my pressing cloth over here. You can use just about anything for a pressing cloth. I'm just going to use this um, cotton. That will work great. And you're just going to press, put that over there, and you're going to press for about 17 to 20 seconds in each section. Now, if you lift up your press cloth, you might see a little poof um, where you've not pressed versus where you have pressed. So it's kind of, you can sort of tell where it's, it's getting fused versus where it hasn't been fused if you kind of look up and peek. But press each section 17 to 20 seconds at a cotton setting. Now on my little heat sealing iron, I don't have a cotton setting. So what works for me on my heat sealing iron is right around 4 to 4.25 because it just has numbers 1 through 5. Um, somewhere around there, around 4 works really well. What I did to figure that out uh, was I took a piece of scrap fabric, I took some scraps of glitter flex, and I fused with my little heat sealing iron at, at started at like two and then went to three. And I did it for 17 seconds on these little squares, and when I found one that fused, that's how I knew, knew that my iron was getting hot enough. I've also noticed that not all iron, irons heat cotton at the same temperatures. So you might want to test your glitter flex on a little scrap on a piece of uh, fabric first, a little square, press it for 17 to 20 seconds. If it's stuck when you try to peel it off, you know that you've got a good fuse and that's the right temperature. So some of those irons take a little bit of playing with to make sure that you have the right recipe, for lack of better words. Okay, so I don't have this iron plugged in because all this, you know, with a, all these wires and everything, I was afraid I might kill myself with, and burn myself with something right there in front of you, and I didn't want to do that. So anyway, we're going to pretend that that got fused and move on to the next step. As you can see, I'm getting this awfully close to my face. So if it were really turned on, that probably would not be a good thing because <laughs> I would probably burn myself. <clears throat> okay, so obviously I ran out of four by four hoops, so I started using my five by seven hoops. So once you have it fused, this is what it'll look like, <clears throat> which looks like pretty much any standard applique out there. Um, you've got your base fabric, your, your stabilizer, it's been trimmed, and it's ready to go. Now, if you want a backing on your little design, this might be the time you wanted to do it. If you wanted it to be completely reversible where the eyes and everything look the same front and back, this is definitely the time you'd want to do it before all the detail was added. So you would use a little um, spray adhesive and uh, you would spray your glitter flex and then put it on the back and then do the detail and it would be the same front and back. You would need to go back on your machine and re-stitch that uh, placement line or the material line so that it would hold the fabric in place. And then you would need to trim the backing as well. <clears throat> so that's one option. So we'll call that option B. Um, <laughs> so once you have done that, then you would move forward. Okay. And I ran out of five by seven hoops doing this. So I had to bring out my continuous border hoop. But again, you would be just using the same hoop. You wouldn't have all these steps along the way. So now what you would do is 
what Debbie recommends is putting another layer of the wash away stabilizer on the back side of the design. And the reason she says that <clears throat> is the satin stitch is very dense and that little extra bit of stabilization really helps. So you float it underneath, which means you just slip it underneath and then she recommends doing a basting stitch, which I did. And then you're going to do your satin outline. And this one happens to have a little um, decorative stitch on the top of the satin outline, which is, that's fine. That's just a little added detail of the frosting. And then once this is done, what you're going to do is you're going to trim really close to the uh, water soluble stabilizer. Or you can use, you know, you pop the design out and you can use a heat sealing, not heat sealing, this is a stencil cutter. Uh, a lot of quilting stores uh, sell it. Again, I don't have it plugged in because I'd probably burn myself with everything, but it gets really super hot and you can just trace around the outer edge and it just melts the cutaway away. You just want to make sure this gets nice and hot. So either trim or close, use... Um, some Q-tips and some water to get the excess water soluble washed away. You don't have to submerge the whole thing. Just kind of dab some water along the edge or you can use this. Now, what if we're gonna go into option C, which is what I did on this one. What if you wanted the back side of the uh, design to not have all the details. You don't want eyes on the front and the back. This one I just wanted um, no detail on the back other than the glitter flex. What I did was I came over here, I stitched out all the detail. So let me go back, I'll get this one. That might be easier for you to see. On this one, I got to this step I stitched out the eyes, I stitched out all the detail, and then I attached the backing to it. So it's just, that's option C. So that's just kind of wherever the timing goes, where you wanna slip that backing on, just however you want that end design to look like is where you slip it. So you have, you know, option A is don't do anything at all to the back, Option B is cover the back before all the detail work is done. Uh, and then option C is to put the backing on there after you've done all the detail, but before you've done the satin stitch. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, how you're going to do the um, design and make it freestanding. Now, if I were smart, <laughs> when I did this last night, I would have stuck a little um, tag on the back or on the front. It doesn't, yeah, it would have been on the back. It would have had to be on the back. Uh, at the time when I stuck the glitter flex on the backing, I would have put in a little ribbon or something to hang my ornament by. That way, it would have gotten caught within the tack down and the satin stitching all in one. So um, it's, uh, you know, just whichever method you want to use and that's how it'll, it, it works really well. But since I didn't put it in there, that's no big loss. I can just hand stitch a little ribbon on there and hang it as an ornament. This could be play food. You know, just whatever you wanted to do. And again, what you're going to do is you can either trim really close or like I mentioned before, you could use that stencil cutter, which I really like using the stencil cutter. Um, and then just with a Q-tip, dab this away. I would want to trim, cut through the stabilizer on the back that's, you know, so that I could trim this away as well so that you could see the backing. Again, when you have any stitching that's gonna show on the back, whether it be the satin stitch or any detail, if it's gonna show on the back, you want to change the color of your bobbin thread. 
so that it matches as well. But see, you'd want to trim that out, and then you could use a Q-tip to get rid of the excess um, stabilization, or not stabilization, but wash away stabilizer. Yeah, I guess stabilization is, is okay to use there. But you're just going to trim it out. And then, like I said, you can use a little Q-tip to get the rest away. But you see on the back, that satin stitch matches the front. And just like I did here, the front and the back, the bobbins, I changed the color so that they match. It would look really tacky, I think, to have... Um, Everything looked really nice on this little guy. Let me turn him this way so maybe it's upside down, but maybe. <laughs> I don't know if you can see him. Um, it would look really tacky to have this all freestanding and to have all this detail really nice and then have the back of the satin stitch be the white bobbin thread. So make sure you do change that, and that's an easy step to miss. You might want to put a, um, a post-it note on your machine, you know, as a reminder change the bobbin thread so that you don't mess up because um, when I first did these when she did an article for Craftsy creating um, actually she used these Christmas cookies to do that she made little Santa cookies and when I was first doing it way back then from her instructions I can't tell you how many times I <laughs> didn't change the bobbin and I had uh, white bobbin thread on the back of my design and that was kind of irritating that I would do that but isn't it cute so that's how you just make any old applique into a freestanding applique I'm gonna go over here and see if we have some questions I hope um, that you will check out the designs magazine it's the current issue the 2017 uh, Christmas issue has the step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this. She explains it very well. Speaking of which, she added another tip um, that I want to mention. Right here, if you look on these little ice skates, there's a hole between the blade and the boot. And that's a very small piece and would be almost impossible to get in there and trim really super close and carefully. So what she used was a buttonhole cutter. She went in with the buttonhole cutter, and these normally come with a little block. If yours didn't come with a little block, be sure to put it over, uh, while it's still in the hoop, put it over a cutting mat. You don't want to do this on your machine. Um, but you'll cut right through. It goes straight through, and it's very sharp, and you can get right up close to that um, placement line for your material. So I thought that was an excellent tip to get into those little areas that are hard to... Uh, to do. If you had something that was a little tiny circular area, even an awl would work. And an awl is that um, a little eyelet cutter. I shouldn't say an awl. The little eyelet cutter. Generally those come with every machine um, out there. When, when you get your machine new, you'll find a little tool and you'll go, what is that? But it's, it's to punch little holes. So sometimes if you need a really tiny area, you might work between the two. One's a little tiny hole, and this one, of course, is for buttonholes. But it works great on something like this, where it's a little bit longer, but it's very narrow. So I thought that was a great tip that, um, that Debbie put in there. So again, check out the design's uh, current issue. It's in... Um, sewing stores it's going to be at dealerships um i'm not sure quilt stores carry this but sometimes they do depends on the quilt store uh i've seen it in, in bookstores too so you might want to check that out if you're one of those that needs to see it visually debbie did a great job so kudos to her and i have another tip from one of our viewers Right here and I thought this I had heard about it but getting a visual from her was awesome this tip comes from Sandy Anderson and Sandy wrote and said that she's been noticing that her tape measurements are not all created equal her tape measures I should say so what she did was she took her tape measures 
and let me show you a little picture that I have. She took her tape measures and she put them on her cutting mat. She taped them with some blue masking tape just to get them right on the one inch line. And she noticed that all three of them were slightly different. Um, the one at the bottom is, by the time she gets to three, it's just a hair over the three inches from her cutting mat. I have heard that uh, the measuring tapes do stretch out over time. I've heard that they sometimes are not created equal from the get-go, no matter what. Um, there's all sorts of reasons that they could be slightly off. Maybe the tip is a little off or whatever, but what happens when they're off a little bit from one another is the farther out you go, I can see a pretty good difference on just by three inches. You spread that over a quilt that's 60 or 120 inches one direction or the other, um, that little three inch boo-boo that's maybe a sixteenth of an inch off, it becomes a very big issue over a, a wider area. So I have always been taught, and I'm sure Sandy has too, that when you start a project, use the same measuring tape, use the same ruler, use the same measuring device that you did when you cut everything out. Stay consistent so that everything will come together better. If you use one measuring tape for one section and one for another, or one ruler for one section and one ruler for another, things can get out of whack. So I thought this was a really good visual. And Sandy, for sending in that tip, we're going to send you five six by 10 um, sh inch sheets of our Glitter Flex. And we have over, it's getting close to 60 colors now on the website that we sell, but we will send you five uh, sheets for sending in that tip. So. If you would like to possibly get some free Glitter Flex, please send me your tips. If I use your tip on our Tuesday's Tips segment here on Facebook, then I will um, send you some as well. So be sure to send me your tips. You can email those tips to bonnie at soinspiredbybonnie.com. <clears throat> so let's come over here. If you think any of this, these tips will help your friends, please share them. Uh, just click the share button and share it with your friends, uh, your sewing friends, your sewing buddies, um, and would love to have them show up. So let's go over here, and I'm gonna see if I have any questions. I sometimes can't see all the questions because they're constantly rolling as as I'm trying to talk and, and do these, so I can't always see everything, but I will go back and read them if I haven't seen it. So let's see what we have. Uh, Carolyn, wow, I didn't realize how inaccurate tapes could be. Gonna check my tapes after the video. Yes, Carolyn, they really can. It's, it's surprising um, and I had heard about it years ago, but a visual really helps to see what's happening. And um, I always was taught to use the same measuring device that I started with, just so that it would avoid having issues with things lining up. Joanne said, this is just so great. So many tips and great projects. Love how clear you are on descriptions. Well, thank you. <laughs> Sometimes in my head, I'm hoping that it's coming across clear. Um, sometimes when it's in your head, you think it's clear, and sometimes you're like, oh, I'm not sure that that's really what I meant to say, but I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad it's making some sort of sense. Um, Judy said, I always buy the same brand of acrylic rotary rulers for the same reason. That's a good idea, Judy, to always get the same brand. Um, I think that would help. I really, I think that's a great, a great idea. Uh, Judy said, I always buy, oh, that's what I just wrote. Um, Linda, okay. I arrived late but caught most of the tips. Always like to see your tips. Well, thank you, Linda. We're glad you made it, even if you were a little late. A, a little late? <laughs> I tell you, I get tongue-tied sometimes. 
I'm glad you arrived, even if you were a little late. Uh, but you can review, we will repost the video on um, our YouTube channel, and it'll be here on our Facebook page for you to go back and review should you need to. Um, and I'll also put it on my Pinterest board. So whatever social media you're on, I think we've got you, got you covered. And I'm going to refresh my page here just to make sure that I don't have any other questions. <clears throat> While I'm thinking about it, um, be sure to sign up for our newsletter. You can do that at our website, which is uh, soinspiredbybonnie.com. Uh, with the newsletter, I send out reminder notices of when we're doing our Tuesday's tips. I also send out sales information as well as new releases, and there's freebies just for signing up. So you'll definitely want to do that. Um, and Anna says, wow, all the clothes I used to make and I never had a buttonhole cutter. Anna, I'm surprised. I have to. I have to say, if you made a lot of clothes, um, I'm surprised you didn't have a buttonhole cutter too. They are very handy. Uh, of course, we, uh, I, I have to admit, we learned how to make buttonholes without buttonhole cutters way back in the dinosaur age, didn't we? <laughs> Not that you're there, but I was. <laughs> so, yeah, we had to do it the old-fashioned way. Um, but... Yeah, the buttonhole cutters are really nice because you don't have to worry whatsoever about accidentally snipping any any threads. It gets right in there. Okay, I think I think we've got everybody covered. I will double check cuz again, sometimes I can't see everything when I'm live here that I can see after the fact. Um but I will I will double check everything and um and look to make sure that we don't have some unanswered questions if they come up. Uh, so I'll be checking that throughout the day and I will add captions uh, later in the day as well. So I hope to see you next Tuesday. I want to thank you for spending a little time out of your busy day. I know this is everybody's really gearing up to get Christmas things done and Thanksgiving's right around the corner. So I want to wish all of you a very happy Thanksgiving and I hope you have a lot of fun with family. Um, be sure to take some time to slow down and enjoy the holidays and not just rush 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 as I know I sometimes am guilty of doing so I figure there's some others out there that are just as guilty as I am. <laughs> we have to remind ourselves, slow down, breathe, enjoy the holidays. Just soak it all in. So I want that for you guys too. So anyway, again, thank you for showing up. I will answer any questions if I haven't gotten to them. And we will see you next Tuesday. Be sure to tell your friends. Be sure to share. Uh, sign up for that newsletter. Like our page. And definitely follow the page. That way you'll get notifications when we do go live. So until next time, bye-bye for now.